Well, good morning, everybody. And welcome to the Foundry. Uh, it is good to see you guys here today. Also, those of you who are joining us on our online broadcast, on our stream, uh, thank you for joining us today. Also, especially to those of you who are joining us on the stream, um, we're going to be doing communion towards the end of our service. Uh, so if you wanted to participate in that with us uh, sometime between now and then, uh, you could go and prepare some elements for yourself uh, so that you can take the bread and the cup with us uh, later on in our service. We're going to start off with a little bit of scripture. We're going to start with John chapter 16, verse 33. And this is after Jesus has been teaching his disciples. He's been saying lots of things to them, telling them lots of things, making predictions and letting them know about his upcoming death and resurrection um, and just teaching them. And he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you have already overcome the world. And we ask that you help us to follow you, Lord, because we know that the ways that you prepare, we're always going to be able to follow because you're going to give us everything that we need to follow your plans, Lord. So help us to be uh, listening and looking for you so that we can be seeking your ways and walking in your paths, God. We want to follow you wherever it is that you're going to lead. We thank you for that transformative power that only you have, and we thank you for your salvation, Lord. Help us as we examine ourselves and examine the world around us to make the right choices um, to be your children, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my I 
I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open. Cause when you called my name, I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. like you to uh, take your seats for a minute. We're going to look back at that call to worship. We're going to look back at that scripture that we started off with. And of course, uh, this was Jesus talking to his disciples. And as we know, we look, we're going to talk about the, the life of the apostle Paul today. And he has a radical turn towards God where Jesus does come and call his name and call him out and bring him into the fold. Um, but I just want to see this John 16, what does this mean to you? It's a pretty famous verse. Um, how do you read it? How do you interpret it? Are there any volunteers that can share uh, what, what they take this to mean when Jesus says this to his followers? Never alone. Anyone else? <laughs> it won't last forever. Yeah. He's always faithful. Yes. He's a little bit bigger than all the stuff we got going on in our life, right? Just, no, he's a lot bigger, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and he's already overcome, and we can get so lost and confused in our own little worlds, uh, going off in our minds and uh, thinking about crazy things and going down rabbit trails, and he says, nope, I already took care of that. I've already conquered that. Come along with me. Yeah, anybody else? You can have God's peace in the midst of trouble. Absolutely. That, that peace that brings wholeness and purpose, too. That's the kind of peace uh, that God brings. I love that. That's awesome. Anybody else? Yeah. If he's already overcome the world, he can do anything. Absolutely. Uh, well, we're going to continue. I invite you to uh, take a look. Oh, yes. Absolutely. God is our comfort and strength, and he's an ever-present help in all of our troubles. Absolutely. And we can lean into that and rely on that. Amen. Well, if you look inside of your bulletins, you'll find a connection card, and we would love to hear from you, especially if you have any prayer requests that you would like to share with us. Um, our pastoral staff loves to get together and pray over the requests that they read on those cards. And if it needs to be private, you can indicate that, um, and they will absolutely keep that private. Uh, but we would love to hear from you there um, on those connection cards. And if you had any tithes and offerings to prepare, this would be a good time as well. If you need an envelope, there are some available in the back. And then now or at any time through the service or on your way out the door, there's two offering boxes in the back of the sanctuary, one on either side. And that's where you can put your connection card um, and any tithes and offerings that you would like to bring.
I invite you to stand with us as we sing a few more songs of worship and praise. in shame, could not get past my blame, till he called my name. I'm so glad he changed me, darkness held me down, but Jesus pulled me out, I'm no longer bound. I'm so glad he saved me, see I'm now a new creation in Christ. The old has gone, there's new life. Awesome celebration that we've got a God who calls us in, changes us new, says get out of that old way, get out of that addiction, get out of that nasty lifestyle and come on in. I've got your name right here ready in my book of life to celebrate with me. How awesome. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We're thankful for your faithfulness that you show to all your children and all the examples that we have throughout history to look back and see just how good you've been. I'm calling on the God, Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now. 
found to do the same thing for me. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock.
Lord, when you call us, you want us to come to you in entirety because you see us and just how you see us, you love us. Before we were your friends, God, you love us. And you call us into a life of obedience, Lord, where you make a way for us to be the holy children that you want us to be. So we want to hand that all over to you today, Father. We thank you so much for the radical transformation that you have brought in so many lives and that you continue to bring today. You can have it all, Lord. Every part of my world. Take this life and breathe on. This heart that is now yours. You can have it all. Every part of my world, take this life and breathe on this heart that is now yours, and all oh, the joy.
Take this life and breathe on this heart that is now yours. Oh, you can have it all, every part of my world. Take this life and This heart that is now yours. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to come before you and lay it all down before you. You can have you can have it all, Lord God. Our fears, our worries, our concerns. Father, we have people who are struggling with their health, who are making tough decisions. Lord God, we pray that your presence would be powerful in their midst. And that you would bring healing, that you would bring miracles, that you would bring answers, that you would just bestow wisdom, Lord God. We ask for those, Lord God, who mental illness is a daily struggle. Father God, you're in control even of that. And we lay it all down before you. Lord God, I pray, just as you have conquered the world, that you help us conquer each day one day at a time. Lord God, we also want to lift up the ongoing war in Ukraine. Father, there's just so many victims and the numbers are rising. Innocent lives are being lost. Fears growing. Father God, you, whom we have declared that you have conquered the world, Lord God, we know that this is not out of your hands at all. But it still saddens us. We're still confused. Sometimes have questions as to why they happen. But Lord, in the midst of the chaos, Father, I pray that you bring beauty as you bring hope in people's lives, in their desperation. Father, I pray that you lift up warriors and saints to rise around them, to, to bring them underneath their wings and protect them and guard them and be one. Lord God, we pray for our community, Lord God. We know that there's a lot going on, Father, in our midst, even here in our nation, Father. We want to submit our authorities to you, Lord God. May you continue to give wisdom. May you continue to give guidance, Lord God. And Lord, we're thankful that we can come before you and present all of these confidently, knowing, Lord God, that you know, that you understand, that you hear our prayers. I just pray for so much mercy, Lord God, and compassion, and that you would answer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. And we're very grateful for Larry, who is uh, visiting us today with a beautiful harmonica. So you're welcome anytime. We have something special prepared today as well. Oh, announcements. Yes, Mother's Day celebration, May 8th. Woo! It's already May. Can you believe that? I know, right? So pretty soon we'll be singing Christmas songs. Trust me. No, I, trust me. Summer's going to go by this fast, and then... You know, it's going to be Thanksgiving, and then you'll be singing Christmas songs. No, I'm just kidding. We have a Mother's Day celebration next Sunday. It will be a bilingual service, so please join us. Um, let's celebrate our moms, and let's bless them, and let's just make their day wonderful and unforgettable. All right? Um, we have something special today as well. Many of you know Richard and Missy or Miranda or however you know her, Right? Um, but 
I know a few Sundays ago we presented them as members, and one of the journeys that we've been um, traveling together as a community is just understanding the calling that God has for us, right? The call to ministry, the call to servant, and the call to do this full time, and the call to do this obediently. And, you know, they've taken some very drastic steps of faith to receive this calling. But we've also taken a step of faith, right, to journey with them and say, hey, we don't really know 100% what we're doing, but we're willing to discover it with you and walk with you, right? Because it's a mysterious journey, right, when God leads. Uh, but we are honored. We're honored to do this with you, and we're honored to be able to partner with you. And, to, and we're honored that you led us, right? to accompany you and to pray for you and to bless you and to, and to just uh, be there for you. So I want to invite them up here. And June, you can come up too. Because when God calls a, f- uh, a person, God calls a family, right? So June is in this ministry as much as everyone else. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So in this process of discovering God's calling, of of accepting God's calling, right, one one of the first steps, of course, is to understand that and to accept it, right? But then there's this process of now what's next? How do we come into this family and continue to develop, continue to grow, continue to take this journey on? And one of the first steps in that is to accept them as local ministerial candidates. That means these are people who are here to serve, to serve this community, to serve the kingdom of God first, right? But to be able to say, we need guidance, we need support, and I call this my family. And we're honored to do that and to be able to journey with them, as I say. So today, we have just a couple of questions for you as local ministerial candidates, right? Um, your social security number, and your, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Some questions that we want um, as a witness to hear, right, as we confidently declare that God has called us into this ministry. Amen? So, Richard and Missy and June... Do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and do you offer yourself in service to him as a local, minister, local ministerial candidate in the Founder Community Church within the Free Methodist Church? <laughs> Recognizing that being a local ministerial candidate in this congregation is an important step in confirming the call of God on your life, do you pledge to diligently seek the Lord's will for your life through prayer and study? It's like, yes. Will you seek, and this is the last question, and accept the guidance of your pastor? I know it's scary, but. <laughs> and, and the local board of administration in order to fulfill these goals. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> we have this um, certificate for you. Yes, I got, I got the right I got the right one, right? But this is just a small, small uh, token, right? The, the bigger celebration is just to be able to pray for them. And that, what an honor to do this and to remember them daily, right? Accepting God's call is not an easy thing. There's many sacrifices, right? And there are, there are many questions and many fears, right? But the joyful part of it is we're being obedient. And God honors the obedience of his saints. So we're going to pray for them. If you could extend your hands over there to them. And we're going to bless them. And anoint them in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, you call each and every one of us to follow you. And then you call some to lead. Not to be above them. But to serve them. And Lord God, what a wonderful calling. Though as challenging as it may be. Though as confusing as it can be, Lord, there are so many joys when we're there for your people to care for them, to feed them, and more than anything, Father, to lead them closer to you. Father God, I pray that you would just equip them 
with the Holy Spirit more than anything else, Lord God. More and more. That they may know your will. That they may know the hearts of the people. That they may know where they're at. And to lead them closer to our loving Father. Lord God, we pray just for an abundance of providence in their lives, Lord God. To know every day that you have taken care of everything. And that we are just here to follow your will. To seek your kingdom, Lord God. And as they continue to seek your kingdom. As we continue to do that with them, Lord God. I pray that we as a community might come along them to support them. To root for them. To cheer for them. And to pray for them, Lord God to see them succeed, to see them succeed because their success is a success in the kingdom of God. And so we bless them in the name of Jesus. Father God, we pray that you would give them wisdom upon wisdom as they follow you, as they follow your guidance. And we pray this, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I think we've got some tissues back there, or maybe not. <laughs> Thank you. All right. What an exciting journey. <clears throat> Me, a persecutor. <laughs> How many of you know the story of Saul? How many of you know the story of Paul? It's the same person, <laughs> all right? Just in case you didn't know. But for me, it's always an interesting encounter between God and Saul. Because for him, the question is, when he meets the risen Christ, is, excuse me, Jesus, me, a persecutor, right? So it's a very interesting dynamic. But before we get to the story, you have to understand that it's been about 40 days now that Jesus has encountered different disciples, right, after his resurrection. He appears to different people, teaching them about the kingdom of God. And we read this in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, Theophilus, the first scroll I wrote concerned everything Jesus did and taught from the beginning right up to the day when he was taken up into heaven. Before he was taken up, working in the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus instructed the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed them that he was alive with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, speaking to them about God's kingdom. Right? So we just celebrated the risen Christ, and now there's a period of 40 days where he meets with his disciples. He teaches them about the kingdom of God to help them understand, and then Jesus ascends. He goes up into heaven, right, on a cloud. But he doesn't leave them without his promise to his followers that he will return within God's timing. In the meantime, there's a task. There's a job for us, right? And that is to live as witnesses. To live as witnesses that Jesus lives now and forever. So go and tell people about that. To live as witnesses that Jesus is the only way to God the Father. Go and tell that to people. To live as witnesses that Jesus is my Lord. Therefore, I live according to his will and not mine. My Lord. So live and tell that to people. And up to this point, we've encountered stories in the, in the New Testament where people have seen the risen Christ with their own eyes, right? And now we jump into a season where now there's no Jesus physically present among them. Now we jump into this phase where people are coming to Christ by simply, what? Hearing about the message of this witness that people are trying to spread. They are living to witness. Now we hear about people who also might have heard the voice of Jesus. But people who hear are still having their lives being transformed. So it's not just people who have seen Jesus that their lives are being transformed. Now it's people that have heard about this Jesus that their lives are being transformed. 
and more exponentially than the 40-day period that Jesus had spent with his disciples, right? We don't know how many, but he spent about 40 days with his disciples. And when we get into that part where they are waiting in the upper room to receive the Holy Spirit, the disciples were numbered around 120, right? But now, these are the opportunities where Jesus sends out his disciples to spread the news. And this is what happens. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, and chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Those who accepted Peter's message were baptized. God brought about 3,000 people into the community on that day. This is right after Peter gives his first sermon, after the Pentecost, right? And then a little later on, Peter heals a lame person, right? And everyone's like, whoa, how did you do that? Well, let me tell you who is behind all of this. And then the story ends by saying, many who heard the word became believers, and their number grew to about 5,000. So these are people who are hearing the message, and, they are, and, and they're believing it, and they're being transformed, right? Then there's this particular story and personal encounter in Acts where Paul doesn't necessarily see the risen Christ, but he hears his voice, and in a very dramatic way. So listen to this story. In chapter 9, verse 1 and 6, it says, Meanwhile, Saul was still spewing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. So he's not even getting close to Jesus, right? He's actually walking the opposite way. He went to the high priest, seeking letters to the synagogues in Damascus. If he found persons who belonged to the way, whether men or women, these letters would authorize him to take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. During the journey, as he approached Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven encircled him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice asking him, Saul, Saul, why are you harassing me? Some versions say, why are you persecuting me? Saul asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are harassing, came the reply. Now get up and enter the city. You will be told what you must do. So you hear these little stories, right, here and there. And there's a purpose behind all of this. Because within the larger narrative, Luke, who is the author of this uh, letter, is trying to show you the progression of this gospel, right? The disciples are seeing and believing in the message of Jesus Christ, right? The Gentiles are seeing and believing the message of Jesus Christ. Now, Pharisees are seeing and believing the message of Jesus Christ. Whatever opinion you might have about Paul for harassing Christians, for imprisoning people who are trying to follow Jesus, you can never forget the one that Jesus has for Paul. Because we're very quick to judge. We're very quick to point the finger and say, oh, yeah, Paul, the persecutor, right? And that might be my opinion about a person, about this person. But you cannot forget the opinion that Jesus has for Paul. Jesus encounters Paul and sees him as worthy to not only have a relationship with, but to call him to serve alongside of him. That's Jesus' opinion of Paul. You're worthy enough for me to call you my partner and to serve me. Likewise, whatever opinion others might have of you, or ones you might have of yourself, you cannot forget the opinion that God has for you, that Jesus has for you. Jesus sees you as one worthy to have a relationship with him. See, sometimes we go around in this world and we say, no one wants to have a relationship with me, right? Oh, then I, that must mean I am this, 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 or that. But you cannot forget the opinion that Jesus has for you, who says, you know what, my son, my daughter, you're worthy enough to have a relationship with me. I want a relationship with you. Not only that, but Jesus also desires this relationship with you so much that he'll take any opportunity you give him to let you know how much he loves you. Any opportunity. If it's every day, then every day he will tell you how worthy you are of this relationship 
and he'll tell you time after time, I love you, my dear child. As many times as you let him. So that's Jesus' opinion of you. And so when Jesus talks to Saul, he tells him, right, the first line, Saul, Saul, why are you harassing me? That's probably a line that Paul never expected to hear if he encountered Jesus, right? Like if I meet Jesus, I'm hoping to hear, oh, Emmanuel, well done, my good and faithful servant. Or, hey, Emmanuel, um, no, I love you. Not, hey, Emmanuel, why are you persecuting me? I'm like, ah, what? No, Jesus, why, why are you saying that? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a persecutor, right? As far as Paul's concerned, you have to understand this. He's doing God's will. He's doing God's will by eliminating this new teaching going around that Jesus is the Savior, the Messiah, that Israel had been waiting for. You see, as a Pharisee, they had a different set of expectations and understanding of who this Messiah was going to be, right? And as far as how this person was going to conduct himself in this earth, one of the first things was this Messiah is supposed to come here and teach people about the law, the Torah, right? And to help people follow it. But Jesus, one of the first things that he does when he comes into this world um, and he starts his ministry, he goes to the synagogue and on a Sabbath, like every good and faithful Jew, right? And he challenges the Pharisees. And he knows that there are some people who are trying to trap him. And there's this person who has a hand that is withered, right? And he tells them, I know what you're thinking. What is better on a Sabbath, to heal or not to heal? To save a life or not to save a life? And right there on Sabbath, when you're not supposed to do any work or any kind of, you know, you're just nothing. You're just resting. It's just completely for God, right? Jesus heals that man. And, and the religious leaders are furious. It's like, how dare he come and challenge the Torah? And he, and he does it multiple times. He comes and reinterprets scriptures for them, right? So right there, they're thinking, this guy is by no way, no means the Messiah. No. They also expect, expect certain prophecies to be fulfilled, right? Apart from who he's supposed to be, there are certain prophecies that had to be, that had to met. For example, one of them was um, this Messiah is to rebuild the temple, right? That had been destroyed time after time. And, and this temple that King Solomon had built, right, that was glorious. And it was destroyed and then built again, right? And now they're expecting it to be rebuilt again for the third time. Like, please bring us back to the old days, this Messiah would fulfill prophecies where, they, where he would gather the Jews from all over the world back to Jerusalem to bring them back to the land. This Messiah would bring world peace through his reign. No more wars, no more pain. And so this Jesus from Nazareth just didn't quite check all the boxes for Paul. You see where I'm coming from now? And so he's saying, there's no way this guy is a Messiah. And all those who are trying to follow him, they're not understanding. So I must cleanse our people from that ideology. So as someone trying to serve the God of Abraham, right? Someone who's trying to serve the God of Moses, the God of Elijah, the God of David, and so forth, and protect scripture. Why are you persecuting me? Probably came to him as a huge surprise like God like this is who I am serving the God of Abraham the God of David the God of Jacob the God of Isaiah the God of Jeremiah like you are the same God and you are telling me why I am persecuting you wow I can't believe all the thoughts that would run through his mind but bigger than the surprise of being knocked to the ground it was just enough to change his view of who Jesus was, and to understand that this guy is really the true Messiah. So Saul is instructed to go to Damascus 
and wait for further instructions. And that's when he meets Ananias, right? Whom Jesus also calls and tells him, who is instructed to bring healing to Paul's side. And he's reluctant. Why? Because there's a reputation. He's like, wait, wait, wait. You want me to meet who? He's like, Saul, no, don't you know who that guy is up to? But no, trust me, he's changed because he's met me. Oh, okay, we'll see. But he, he, he meets him and sure enough, he's changed, right? I mean, how much of a threat can you be when you're blind? But he comes to Ananias, he's blind, and he receives his sight. Now, the very people that Paul was persecuting and harassing, he is before them to receive healing and belonging. Acts chapter 9, verse 17 through 20 says, Ananias went to the house. He placed his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord sent me. Jesus, who appeared to you on the way as you were coming here, he sent me so that you could see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, flakes fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. After eating, he regained his strength. He stayed with the disciples in Damascus for several days. Right away, he began to preach about Jesus in the synagogues. He is God's son, he declared. Wow. One encounter to turn an enemy of God to a friend of God. Just one encounter. You have to understand this. An encounter with the risen Christ is not about entertainment. An encounter with Jesus Christ is not about an entertainment. You don't come to church to meet Jesus and be entertained. You come to church to meet Jesus and be changed and be transformed. That's what it's meant to be. Jesus is not going to meet you just to entertain you. <laughs> Right? An encounter with Jesus is about transformation. It's about God at work. Sometimes, yes, it can be dramatic, like Paul's encounter with God, and sometimes not. My encounter with God, with Jesus for the first time, was in high school, in my boarding school, in the nursery. I was spending the night in the nursery because I was not feeling well. I was just overwhelmed with guilt and shame. And right there and then, the nurse told me, well, why? We have such a loving God who forgives us for everything. It's like, no, not for what I did. It's like, no, trust me, for everything. And I understood then, even though I grew up Christian, even though I went to church and probably never missed a Sunday, right? But there and then, I knew I had encountered the risen Christ. And my life was transformed. And my life was given to Christ to serve him. So it may not be as dramatic even as that. And overall, though, we can't miss the power of that encounter. That every time you meet Jesus, it's God at work. That there's some kind of transformation happening. And one of the most crucial transformations that occurs when we encounter Christ is identity. You see, Saul went, and this is what just blows my mind. Saul went <clears throat> from Pharisee to slave of Jesus Christ. Do you understand the drastic difference? Saul went from Pharisee to slave of Jesus Christ. Saul went from persecutor to an apostle. Someone who's out there spreading the news that Jesus is risen. So this is from the first letter he writes. He writes a total of 13 letters that are in the New Testament, right? And one of the first letters that he writes is Galatians. And this is his first <clears throat> introduction. And he tells this to the people in Galatia. From Paul, an apostle who is not sent from human authority or commission through human agency, but sent through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and from all the brothers and sisters with me. Wow. If his circle of Pharisees were to hear what he just said, they'd probably fall backwards and say, what did this Pharisee just declare? It's a big change. It's a big transformation. We long, right, for an encounter with God. We don't want to meet God 
We all want to say, God, I want to feel you. God, I want to see your presence. God, I want to meet you. And God desires it as well for you and I. But my question is, are we truly ready to have an encounter with God? Because he's not going to meet you to entertain you. <clears throat> he's going to meet you to change you. He's going to meet you to challenge you. He's going to meet you to transform you. He's going to meet you to create something new, right? So are we ready to be told the truth? I'm pretty sure Saul wasn't ready to be told, yes, you are a persecutor, <laughs> right? But he was willing to hear and accept. Are we ready to be changed? Because an encounter with Jesus is about transformation. It's about God at work. Whether that work is to create a new heart in you, whether that work is to create purpose in your life, whether that work is to create peace in your life, or create joy in your life, or create hope in your life, or even create stillness in your heart. An encounter with God is about God at work. And here's the good news. That your encounter with God doesn't have to be as dramatic as Paul's encounter with God. Now, it might be your thing, right? I mean, you might like that kind of stuff where God knocks you down to the floor and you go blind for three days, right? If you like that kind of encounters with God, then go ahead, ask for it, right? But I'm not going to ask for that. I'm just going to say, God, I don't need any of that drama. I just need to encounter with you and hear your voice. Your encounter with God begins with giving him the space in your daily life. See, God's not going to meet us if we're not ready, if we don't give him the space. We live busier and busier lives, yes. As we come into this transitioning phase of this pandemic, we don't know if we're still in it or we're out of it, right? But we are definitely in this transition. The pandemic didn't really slow down our lives. We thought it was going to because it slowed down a lot of things, but it just slowed certain areas of your life, but then it sped up others, right? It's crazy. Because I thought I was going to slow down. I sure didn't slow down. It slowed down the same areas of my life. But, man, some of the other areas, it just went fast forward. And it's just a constant battle of what am I to slow down. And yet here we are still struggling to give God the space in our day. Right? You have to understand that God wants your cooperation, not your isolation. God wants your cooperation, not your isolation. So I pray for God encounters in your life. I really do. When your name pops up in my mind throughout the day, I pray, God, meet, meet this person where they're at. They need you. Because I know what happens when God encounters people. So I pray for God encounters in your lives as you create the space for it and, and, and as you cooperate with him. Because I know this 100%, trust me, 100%, I believe this, that God is eager to show you what he's working on in your life when he encounters you. He's eager, he's desperate. Just like when your kid comes to you and says, look what I've done. Look at this amazing drawing, even though it's just a bunch of scribbles, right? But every little thing, they want to show you the progress. God, he, you have no idea just how much he wants to show off the work that he's doing in your life. Hey, my child, look what I've done. Look how much we've come along. Look what we've worked on. Look what we did together. God is eager to create so many beautiful things in your life. Yes, even in the midst of your brokenness. Even though your life is shattered in 100 pieces, he wants to show you that he can put it back together and make it beautiful in his own way. God is eager to remind you how worthy you are to him. So I pray for these encounters these God encounters in your life. And I ask that you would cooperate as he shows you just the wonders that he's doing in your life. So let us make space for him.
as we follow him. Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for being a God who doesn't run away from us. Lord, there are people whom I would run away from. But yet here you are, God, who just chases us relentlessly. You're not scared of our mess. You're not scared of our brokenness. You're not scared, Father God, of who we are. But Father God, you come before us. You encounter us. And you're eager, Lord God, to just show us just the work that you're doing in our lives. Father, I pray that we may have eyes to see that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As Isaac mentioned in the beginning, um, we will be celebrating communion in this moment. And those who are watching us online um, can prepare now your solid and your liquid. And those who are here present, you should have gotten um, the communion cups. If not, they are in the back. And if I could have Monica, please help us distribute that. So, <clears throat> as we prepare for this, there's a scripture that I want to read all of us together. And we're going to, you're going to read the bowl, the part that it's in bold. And we're going to declare this. It's because of Jesus that we have this opportunity to declare this about God. It's because of Jesus that we can come before him and say, yes, this is my God who is for me and not against me. It's because of Jesus that we can trust in these words of this psalmist. So let us read. It says, I will lift you up high, my God, the true king. I will bless your name forever and always. The Lord is great and so worthy of praise. God's greatness can't be grasped. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, very patient and full of faithful love. All that you have made gives thanks to you, Lord. All your faithful ones bless you. The Lord supports all who fall down, straightens up all who are bent low. The Lord is close to everyone who calls out to him, to all who call out to him sincerely. God shows favor to those who honor him, listening to their cries for help and saving them. Amen. What a wonderful reminder. And this we can declare and have faith in and have confidence in because of Jesus who gave his life and made a way for us to this amazing Father that we just declared about and blessed. So I invite you, and this invitation is for all. We have an open table where all are welcome to partake. So uh, you who truly and earnestly repent of your sins, who live in love and peace with your neighbors, and who intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking in his holy ways, Draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and humbly kneeling to make your honest confession to Almighty God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for encountering us here on earth first as we came into this world. 
as you gave your life, as you met us right here in the midst of our brokenness, but you saw redemption, you saw hope, you saw light, you saw love, you saw children, you saw names, you saw people made in the image of God, and you didn't give up. You came back to life, Lord God, so that today we could remember the God who made all of this possible. Heavenly Father, I pray that you create a clean heart, pure heart and clean hands, Lord God. We ask for forgiveness. But just as much as we ask this for us, we do this because we had a personal encounter with you. Lord God, I pray for those who don't have or have not had yet an encounter with you. Father, you know those names. We lift them up personally before you. And we believe in the power of Jesus' name. So we pray in Jesus' name that you would meet these people, these names, and reveal yourself to them. We thank you for this opportunity to remember how much you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. As you prepare the bread <clears throat> on the top part, in the night of his betrayal, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us take the bread. As you prepare the cup, in like manner, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us take the cup. We're going to sing one more time about that glorious day. We needed rescue when our sin was heavy. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy. But chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healer. dismissed let me bless you and remember this the God who conquered the world the God whom he says there's nothing impossible for him may you encounter that God this week and may he bring you peace in your life may you be blessed and I pray you have a very blessed week bye